Boy, howdy. Hello, everyone. I'm Father Aaron. Welcome to the Dark Minister. Okay, so if you missed the last episode, do watch that one first because these are really of a piece. They are really part of the same action. Caramorg the dragon was out on patrol hunting with his sister. He spotted the giant skein and came to, well, first to investigate what is this giant doing here, and Skein attacked him, and of course a big bat, just watch the episode. Anyway, this all happened. Varmorg, his sister, was with him, saw Karmorg dive, saw what happened, and began flying there. But of course we're talking about um, distances, you know, when the two dragons out hunting together, they're not going to be close together, they're a distance apart. So together, I mean, there's some space there, and she had to get there, and really combat doesn't take that long. We're talking six second rounds, and it wasn't much combat, because two lightning bolts, six magic missiles, boom, right? Okay, so she is on her way. Just a note about the naming convention for dragons. First of all, understand this is not a naming convention that I, I planned out, I had it all, I stumbled upon it, okay? I chose the name Morag for the main dragon, the white dragon that has moved into the area, Morag. And, and that's a real name, I think. They're, I've never met a Morag. Have you ever met a Morag? Yeah, I guess that's true. So, Morag is a real name, but at any rate, that's the name of the main dragon. When it came time for the party to fight, Morag's son, Balamorg, in the episode where they fought their first dragon. When it came time to fight him, I decided, I came up with the name Balamorg, and I can't remember if I read it somewhere or heard it. I don't know if it's a real name or a place name or a word that I translated into Gaelic. It, it, it might be. I don't remember. You can Google it and find out if Balamorg means anything, and if it does, let me know. I'll Google it after this myself. Anyway, I liked it because of the morgue. It echoed morag, right? So I decided that dragon names come from the mother. It's a matrilineal descent. And the, they take the, the mother's name and they somehow shorten it, truncate it, and make that part of the young dragon's name. So morag has balamorg, and we've met carmorg, and we're about to meet varamorg. Now, I could pretend that I calculated how far away Varamorg was, and that I then broke down how long it would take for her to get to the... No, I didn't do that. I didn't do that. I did what would be cool. What would be cool is if they just defeated one dragon and another... Well, Karmorg has crashed to the ground, and everyone breathes a sigh of relief when they hear the screech of a dragon close. And <laughs> Skein is struck in the back by Varamorg flying down in fury. There will be no talking with this giant. There will be no discussing matters of what are you doing here and whose property this is. None of that. She sees the body of her brother and she comes to kill. Now, Varamorg is a far smarter dragon than Karmorg. Far smarter, far cannier. She knows that cold breath is going to do nothing uh -huh. against a frost giant. And so she attacks claws and teeth. I give her two claw attacks and a bite, slamming into Skane from the back. And does she hit? Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh, 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 oh yeah. She does, not with everything. The bite hits and one of the claws, the other claw just sort of misses. Maybe the angle she came in, she didn't get any shoulder, but the other two, boom, and... Okay, basic book dragons are not that tough, and they don't do that much damage when they attack, except with their breath. And I should do a whole video about using dragons in basic, because, boy, 
they can be a challenge. They can be a challenge to employ. But suffice to say that although they are big and tough, kind of, I mean, six hit dice for a white dragon in the, be the basic book, um, their damage is not terribly impressive, right? It just isn't, other than the breath weapon. And Varamorg knows that it will be useless against a frost giant. Now, keep in mind, she does not see anyone else here. She did not see the combat happen, right? Uh, she was racing on her way there, but it was still too far away to make up to make out minuscule things like elves, etc. She may have somewhere in her vision that there's a, a halfling standing there looking disappointed, right? But she's not seeing much of anything else. She knows that the breath isn't going to work, so she has come with a physical attack. Boom! Into Skane. He stumbles down and falls. She lands on top of him. Now... She sees the halfling, and the halfling sees her. From their hiding places, the elves are horrified. They have used both of their lightning bolt spells, and even though magic missile, when it's cast at their level, they get three missiles each, right? Which totals six missiles. They think of it as being a relatively low-powered spell, right? So they're thinking, oh no, <laughs> they have webs that they could shoot. But that's about it. Meanwhile, from her place in hiding, Faux Fire fires an arrow and it finds home. Remember that her bow is specifically a bow plus two against dragons, Sigamund's bow. And so she draws that thing and an arrow comes flying out, strikes the dragon. Now she is furious. Where did that come from? But she doesn't have much time to wonder because up charges Touchberry. You'd think that at this point, he would want to light some oil and chuck it at her and light her on fire, but he doesn't. He just charges forward with his sword and he rolls a hit as he, yes, he does. Boom, he strikes home and the dragon is now roaring in anger. She's been struck by an arrow, struck by a sword and is starting to understand why her brother went down. It was not just this frost giant. She leaps leaps onto the halfling. The elves, incidentally, Fleetwood is getting his bow ready, so he's switching out, because he'd been holding a sword and casting spells. He switches to bow at this point. Bob Johnny is sneaking around. He wants to web the dragon, but he wants to do it in such a way to grab her wings. And I say, you can't launch web from like 100 feet away. You've got to kind of be right there. So he's trying to get around so he can get her wings. Remember, Skein is face first on the ground under this dragon at the moment. What he's going to do, we'll, that well, we'll see. Anyway, he doesn't have much time under the dragon because she is grabbing that halfling. Two claw hits, okay, one hits, they both hit. This means that she is going to grab the halfling ah! and she's going to take off. Right. This is not something that is discussed in the, uh, the basic rules, uh, you know, picking someone up. And I think basic book dragons are probably supposed to be too small to carry people away. I mean, look, they're crying out loud. But a halfling is small. A halfling may be twee enough to be picked up by a dragon. I'm going to say yes. I'm going to say Veramord is picking up this halfling who has dared to strike her and lifting off into the sky. The great winds begin to beat, and then suddenly they stop tangled together in a thick, sticky web. Bob Johnny got into position and fired his web at the dragon, and the beast is temporarily snared. They are definitely in the category of strong enough to break out of a web. This is not going to be a problem for the dragon, but it does slow her down. Meanwhile, Fleetwood has gotten his bow. Fofire still has hers. They both fire arrows. And Flowfire hits Fleetwood misses. Okay, so a bit more damage to the dragon, bringing her down, right? I don't know why Fleetwood does not at this point cast Magic Missile just immediately. I think he sort of mentally checked that one off the list because he's shot one Magic Missile, but he had two. I think he just sort of mentally checked it off the list. Okay, so he fires his bow and misses. Flowfire hits uh, for decent damage, not, not massive, like five or six points, something like that. Skane 
is climbing to his feet behind the dragon. The spear was knocked from his hand, so he's got to go get that if he's going to do anything with it. That's what he's doing. He's running for that. He also bellows into the forest <sighs> for his polar bears. His polar bears had, had run off. He'd sent them into the woods to hide with the idea that they would ambush Karamorg, but of course Karamorg didn't need it. <laughs> But here's Veramorg, and we might need some help. So he bellows for the polar bears, and they begin to emerge from the forest. This is partly all of this activity, and realizing how many people are around her is why Veramorg starts to take off. She's like, okay, clearly this is not a good situation. I don't want to be here. So she starts to take off. She rips herself out of those webs, and again, the wings start beating. She begins to lift off. Two more arrows come for her. This time, she figures out where one of the archers is, and she breathes a cold breath down at Fleetwood. Oh, you make your saving throw. <laughs> okay, he does. He does. Just barely. Just barely. There was actually a sort of nervous intake of air around the table because he rolled it and they looked at the number and like, uh-oh. Then he looked at his sheet and said, oh, who just made it. Right, just made it. All right, he takes a wallop of damage. I don't remember what it was at the time, but he takes a wallop of damage and he is like, boom, down in the single digits, okay? Because he had some damage earlier, he was not in the perfect health to start with. So he's down <laughs> into single digits and this is not good. This is not good at all, all right, as Veramor continues to take off. Now, do you think that Touchberry is going to just be calmly carried off to be eaten by dragons? Do you think Touchberry is the kind of halfling who's going to just submit to this? Oh no. Oh no. Although he has a penalty to strike, because I, I say you, you are being held, but I say, okay, your arms are, you, you've got one arm free enough, but you're being held and close to the dragon, so you don't have a huge sling range, right? All right. You can try to strike with a minus three penalty on the hit roll. All right, what do you do? If there was ever a time to roll a nat 20, that was it. Boom! Thrusting that sword into the beast, it howls in rage, in rage. And he takes double damage plus the bonuses. Oof, da. Oof, da. He, he does like 13 points of damage with one strike, right? He's, he's got a strength bonus, he's got a, a sword, a magic sword, plus one, plus two d6. Boom! Into the thing. Howls in rage. What is it going to do? What's it going to do? It, it wants to get away, is what it wants. It wants to get away and begins to fly. Now, at this point, the thing is only about 20 feet off the ground. If she dropped Touchberry now, it's not going to be that bad. She keeps going. She keeps going. And, and just a word on this. It's taking her a while to get off the ground because if you've ever seen a big bird, you know, to start to take off, there's a lot of flapping to begin with because there's a lot of mass there. There's a lot of weight. So it takes a bit to get them in the air and they're ungainly until they get in the air. So that's where the, the point that she's still at, right? It's about 20 feet up and rising. <laughs> at this point, Skane has his spear, right? Now, a frost giant is a good 18 feet tall, the spear is quite long, so this is not going to be a challenge. He thrusts up at the dragon and... <laughs> if there was ever a time not to roll a natural one, that was the time. The spear deflects off the scales and slips from his hand. It had gotten snow and ice on it when it fell on the ground, it was slippery, so it off it goes. He curses and goes chasing after the spear a second time. Another arrow from Faux Fire finds its mark. It only does about four points of damage. I think it wasn't a, a big damage roll for her. And finally, the elves launch their magic missiles, slamming into the creature. The rolls weren't great. They weren't huge, huge damage, but it was a wallop, more than the dragon had taken previously, and begins to reconsider its life choices when Touchberry strikes again. Slam with the sword! This time, does not roll so well. Glances off the scales, nothing. The dragon continues to rise. We're now over 30 feet. It is rising with every round. <laughs> oh dear. At this point, another arrow from Faux Fire, but it misses. 
And the players are saying, well, we, we can't, if we kill the dragon now, she's gonna fall and Touchberry's gonna, but it can be crushed, is gonna die, right? What do we do? What do we do? Skein, if the dragon falls, catch Touchberry. Uh, all right, okay. Touchberry, meanwhile, his player has gotten into a rather nihilistic place and is like, I'm gonna kill this dragon. But, but if you fall, you may die. I don't care. And so he strikes again and this time finds home. Rolls, uh, you know, like an 18 or 19 or something, an insanely good roll. Okay. Hits the dragon. And that's enough. That's enough. The damage he deals is enough. She was down, down, down. And now she begins to fall with a loud, wailing cry. She begins falling to the earth. Oh, Skane. What you gonna do? All right. Skane here could very well just say, Not my problem. And let them crash to the ground. <laughs> because it isn't his problem. He's come along as an ally because he wants to get rid of the dragons. Right? And if a few of these, these puny ones die along the way, what does he really care? Okay. But they have impressed him. He also knows that they're more likely to succeed if all of them are alive. And this little one impressed him with his absolute, you know, reckless courage. So, we're going to make a reaction roll for, a, you know, a standard monster reaction roll. And a friendly result means he's going to help. And, a, you know, an unfriendly result means he's, he doesn't care. He's just going to let him fall. All right. So, let's roll him up. He's going to try to help. Skane rushes toward where the creature is falling. Now, understand that for Skane, the distance feels less, because although it's over 30 feet up, close to 40 feet up, being 18 feet tall, he's almost half of that, right? So it doesn't feel as great a drop to Skane, right? So he's rushing in to see what he can do. Now, I decide, no, right? He, he can't actually take the full weight of this thing. He can't, like, catch the dragon, like, like... Andre the Giant at the end of Princess Bride, right? Hello, dragon. Um, no, but what he can do is he can try to, as the dragon falls, grab onto it and turn it so that at least, as it falls, Touchberry isn't on the bottom because that's where he is currently, right? So this is what I'm doing. All right, it's going to be a standard to hit, um, but it's going to have a three penalty because this is a very specific thing you're trying to do. You're not just trying to hit something, you're trying to, to grab and manipulate it somehow as it falls out of the air. All right, what is he gonna roll? Yeah, okay, a, a frost giant is big enough, has a high enough hit dice that its, it's two hits are pretty low, right? It's, it, it can hit things relatively easily, and he does. He gets there in time, and he grabs onto the hind legs of the dragon as it falls and pulls on them, turning the body over as it falls, giving it a pivot point and crashes to the ground. Now, Touchberry still takes some damage, right? He's not going to get out of this unscathed, and oof, oof. <laughs> he takes a wallop as he lands, but is still alive. There's that. All right. Now Skane says, We must go very quickly. Because you know, all this time, the dragons have been screaming and roaring and bellowing and hollering, right? And if something else must have heard this. Something else heard this. There's going to be trouble. So, he says, We must go. Quickly. We cannot fight another one. And the elves agree, and Fofire agrees. Touchberry says, Not without some teeth. Okay. He's going to chop teeth out of the dragon. This has been a thing. Collecting teeth and body parts has become sort of a, a gruesome calling card of our group. Fleetwood, mostly. Fleetwood collects the most body parts, but even he at this point is like, no, 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 let's just go, let's just go. But Touchberry won't leave without a tooth from each dragon. And if he's going to stay, well, Fleetwood will chop off a scale or two anyway. And that's what they do. Okay, okay, you're going to have a high probability that another dragon has heard you. <laughs> All right. Another dragon did not. That would have been so cool. I don't know. <clears throat> How many children does this dragon have? Well, yeah. We don't know yet. 
I know. Five. There are five killed. Well, they've killed three. So there's two left. Plus Moag. Don't tell the players. So they hurriedly butcher these bodies, or at least hack pieces off of these bodies. It's really gruesome, isn't it? Anyway, they get some trophies, and they take off, just running. And Skane says, Toward the mountain, toward the mountain, there are valleys there we can hide in. Right? He needs to rest. He's beat up from two dragons now. And, you know, so off they go. What they are running from is, of course, their imagination of Morag coming for vengeance. They don't know this. They've got no indication that it's happening. It, in fact, is not. But they are afraid, and so they are booting it through the snow. Now, it is getting later and later and later as they go. The light is getting dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. And so they begin to feel a little safer, right? They can't be seen as easily, not knowing that dragons can see in the dark. But anyway, all right, here they come charging along. And again, the forest here is it's not real, real thick, but um, but it, it's, it's thick enough. It's enough cover. Charging through the forest toward the mountains. When surprise roll fails, you hear something. There's something up ahead. Everyone braces. Oh no, what is it now? It's not a dragon. A dragon's not hiding behind a tree. But there is something hiding in the forest ahead. Several somethings. Their first thought is goblins. Those bloody goblins have followed us. Well, they're right about that, actually. But no, these are not goblins. These are not goblins. They stand and call out, Who is there? Who goes there? And out from behind the trees step ice dwarves. <laughs> okay, okay. So, I tried to be all impressive with that name. But the ice dwarves, well... I'd had an idea about a sort of, you know, a relative of the dwarves. It comes from Gully Dwarves in the Dragonlance books, okay? The, the idea of these sort of hapless, goofy, slightly incompetent tribe of dwarves that are looked down upon by other dwarves, right? They're not considered serious. And I, I had had it in my mind that some creature like that lived in this valley still, hidden, lowly, staying out of the way of the dragons, having this very, very minimal existence on the edge of the valley, right? Well, then I got a box of minis from Shonuff, and one of them, or three or four of them, were these guys. <laughs> They're like almost perfectly round, and I, I compared them to the dwarves that I already had, because I'd, I'd purchased and painted up, not nearly as well as he did, um, purchased and painted up some dwarves, well, my dwarves that I already had, and which we'd already used in the game, like a good head taller. I mean, they're they're much bigger, and they're less roly-poly. So the idea of putting these dwarves next to the ones I had and trying to pretend that they're all the same race didn't make much sense. But as a subset of dwarves, as a relative of dwarves, a, another offshoot tribe, perfect. These are the ice dwarves, and they are not terribly smart. They're good diggers, they're good miners, they have all of the physical capacity of dwarves in terms of mining and digging and, and, and that kind of stuff, and, and gem shaping and everything else, but they're not terribly bright, and they're not as much of warriors. They do have a sort of warrior attitude, but they're not very good at it, okay? So... Here they are, and they surround, you know, the, the players. I, I, it's only a handful of them, but it's enough to make them nervous because they have no idea who these are. And up one waddles. What have you been doing? You don't look good. Okay, all of my non-human intelligent races sound the same. I mean, this could be a kobold, this could be a goblin, this could be... Uh, anyway. You don't look good. Where are you going? What have you been up to? We heard roar. We heard a dragon. Are you fighting dragons? Well, they're not far off. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. Another one pipes up. There are goblins here, too. Goblins not far off. We should get away soon. Not enough of us for fight goblins. Not when you look like that. Fair enough. Okay. At this point, Skein chimes in. Do not talk to these. Ice dwarves. They filthy. They stupid. They useless. Bah! Do not talk to them. We go. Come, come, we go. Well, 
there is a bit of animosity here, a frost giant is going to look down on these creatures. He just has no respect for them. They are, they're, they're the filth, they're the dirt, they're the nothing of this world, right? So Skane's not about this. No, 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 no. But the dwarves say, come, come, you need to get some shelter, let's go, let's go! And here the players decide that cute is more important than powerful. <laughs> you know, they liked them. They liked them, they thought they were adorable, and so they say, we need a place to rest, Skane, and I don't, we don't want to sleep out in a valley exposed to the elements and potentially to the dragons, right? So they decide to go with the ice dwarves. And Skane says, This is stupid. You go with dwarves. I no go with dwarves. You get serious about dragon, you call me. And stomps off. Just stomps off. But how do we call him? He didn't leave his phone number. Yeah, yeah, the 411 doesn't work in, in my world. It just it's no internet. Anyway, off he goes. All right. Ice dwarves, lead on. 